Good morning to all of you here at IIT Madras and a warm welcome to the launch of the Nilakani Center at AI for Bharat. A warm welcome to also our online audience who have joined through uh, Zoom. We have a packed program for you through the day, but to begin, let us have an invocation. I would like to invite Dr. Durga, an alumna from IIT Madras. In keeping with the spirit of AI for Bharat, she will perform in five different languages, one sentence each. Mahaganapatim manasasmarami Vasishta vama deva divinutam Mahaganapatim Batamutina padakahara nebahu hasta chatushta ne Pashankusha dharane Gaiye ganapati jagavandan Shankar suvan bhavani nandan Gaiye ganapati jagavandan Amba vani nanadarimpa ve Amba vani nanadarimpa ve Ani mutta barana alankrita priye Amir dinum gini Ye Shri Saraswati Namostute Varade Parade Vate Shri Pati Gauri Pati Guru Guha Vinute Vidiyuvate Shri Saraswati Namostute Thank you, Durga. Uh, the ancient words are various, but the divine calling is the same. We would request all of you to please uh, stand up for the Tamil anthem. Now we request our chief guest, Sri Nandan Nilakani, to please come on stage and light the lamp. We have an eco-friendly electric lamp. I would also request uh, Director Professor Kamakoti and Dean uh, of Alumni and Corporate Relations, Professor Mahesh, to please accompany our chief guest. We now request uh, Nandan Nilakni to open the plaque of the center and to officially inaugurate it in the presence of our director, Professor Kamakoti. The Nilakini Center at AI for Bharat has been set up with a generous grant of rupees 36 crores from the Nilakini family to advance open source Indian language technologies, 
IIT Madras, and the team at AI for Bharat are deeply grateful for the support. We now request Professor Kamakoti to hand over a memento of appreciation to Sri Nilakeni. Uh, we also have a surprise. Uh, I would request uh, Professor Mitesh Khapra, the principal investigator of the center, to give a gift uh, from our language team at AI for Bharat to Sri Nilakeni. So the language team at AI for Bharat, uh, uh, we have 100 of them across the country. They have uh, looked at Rohini Nilakeni's storybooks and translated Srinivas Sringeri's books into 22 Indian languages. They have been printed and being shared. Thank you very much, sir. Request the guests to please take their seats. And I would like to invite Professor Kamakoti to address the audience with the uh, inaugural address. So a very good morning to all of you. Uh, Nandan, a very hearty welcome to IIT Madras. A for Bharat is a dream for IIT Madras and also the country. We had been uh, talking about AI to a large extent, started practicing AI, and of course, educating AI in large scale over the last at least the two decades has seen a very, very gradual rise and of late in the last few years we have seen an exponential increase in all these aspects. AI is termed as an economy changer, something that's going to transform many countries and in that direction all explorations that need to be in place to get the maximum benefit out of this entire technology are currently being explored by many countries and India also has you know responded to this much in my opinion much faster and much better than the other parts of the world. There are many attempts that have been made in the past starting uh, in a big way from 2015 onwards. To bring in AI into the mainstream, there are many B.Tech courses that are started, there are M.Tech courses that have been in place. Many, many sets of data are being now collected and industries are also getting sensitized to use AI. And this is something which we are seeing as a growing trend. As an educational institute, somewhere around 2015 or 16, we were asked what is the impact of AI on your projects. If you look at IIT Madras, we do have every project proposal that is submitted, we do ask, is there an AI component in this project? So at different levels, we are getting ourselves sensitized to using AI for good, for understanding the technology better, for also solving many social economic problems. I think in this direction, AI for Bharat is a very, very important initiative. And we heartfully thank Nandan and uh, Rohini for this very generous contribution. And I'm sure this is going to be extremely beneficial to our institute and also to our country. I also congratulate both uh, Mitesh and uh, Pratyush and also Vivek for uh, putting this together and bringing it to this shape. We also see very, very uh, strong support from the government specifically from the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology to these efforts. We also have the Bhashini project, the National Language Translation Mission, which is also going to be extremely important for us. What we need to do today when we look at the publications that come out of India, one of the biggest issues that we see there is the lack of good data. One of the efforts that we as educational institutions in uh, coordination with the industry must take within the next uh, uh, few years is to get very credible, well-documented, sanitized, strong data sets which are unbiased, which gives a good feel, which gives a correct feel of what the real world looks like when we interpret the data and try to ma match it with what is happening in the real world. I think that's going to be extremely important, 
and I'm sure AFR Bharat will aspire to do this, not just in uh, one discipline, but across multiple disciplines. I strongly urge all the... Uh, AI, we have the Robert Bosch Center for Data Science and AI, which we started five years before. We see 27 uh, faculty from at least eight departments in that center working together on a common cause to bring AI into engineering. I think this cross-disciplinary, multidisciplinary work should continue. And every field, every field of engineering should start contributing to this data set. Uh, and uh, that is going to be extremely crucial for the success of uh, projects like AFR Bharat. Uh, this is my request, and I'm sure uh, I, I see a lot, lot of industry participants here, students, and also faculty from uh, different disciplines. Uh, this is again a request that let us all join together to make good data sets for the country, which will enable us to develop very good AI models, and uh, which will help us to compete in terms of, uh, you know, the quality of products, research products that come out of our country. IIT Madras will also be shortly uh, uh, getting up a school for medical sciences and technology. AI for medicine is something going very important. And I'm sure this will be a very, very strong uh, point for us. AI for Bharat with our medical school, I think that will be a very interesting combination. and. Uh, and that will also be something that we will have a direct relevance to the uh, human living, right? So when we could use AI to diagnose diseases much faster and also uh, much quicker, I think that's going to be a big contribution to the world. And that's what AI is expected to deliver. And I'm sure uh, with the medical school and AI for Bharat, I see a very, very long collaboration and uh, very strong relationship that we can build and very, very strong diagnosis tools that we can build out of this. Last but not the least, we are also looking at sustainability in a very big way. And um, we have the uh, SDG 1 to 17 uh, UN goals. And many of them are, are, will be, many policies in that will be driven by data. And uh, so we do have lot more of automation that we are doing, many institutes are doing, education institutions and industry. And these automations are basically bringing out a lot of data. I think that is also something we need to look at. Uh, and in our sustainability uh, journey, uh, the role of AA for Bharat would be very significant. So I see a bright future for AA for Bharat. And I think it's a correct point where we have started. Uh, we start with AI, then bring the medical school, then the sustainability effort. I think these will go extremely good together. And uh, I wish this center great success. And again, I take this opportunity to thank Nandan Rohini for this very generous contribution. And we look forward to many more relationships in future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Kamakoti, uh, or Kama as he's endearingly called in the campus. Uh, we take your call for creating data sets as the key goal in AI. Uh, we should also know that Kamakoti has been a great uh, proponent of open source hardware even with, with the Shakti processor. We are also looking to do stuff at AI for Bharat with open source motive, sir. So we, we are very uh, grateful for your inspiring words. Uh, now I would like to invite Professor Mitesh Khapra, Associate Professor at uh, IIT Madras and principal investigator at the AI for Bharat Center to give us an overview of AI for Bharat, the organization, and its key accomplishments till date. We won't be surprised if you feel you, uh, you're back in classroom because Mitesh is routinely ranked as one of the best teachers in the campus. Please. Thanks, uh, Pratyush, uh, for the kind introduction. A uh, bit embarrassing, but I'll thank you anyways. Uh, so let me begin by welcoming you all to this event. It's been a great journey for us the past two years, and we are very excited to be here today where we are launching the Nilikani Center at AI for Bharat. And I'll once again take the opportunity to thank the Nilikani family for their generous grant towards advancing AI technology for Indian languages. We have been very fortunate in our journey. Uh, along the way, we have received support from various well-wishers. I would like to call out two in particular. 
Microsoft and Extep Foundation, who have been supporting our activities in various ways, be it compute, data sets, researchers, and so on. So I'd like to thank them for this. Now, uh, going forward, what I'll do in the next five to seven minutes is I'll tell you what AI for Bharat is about, what our mission is, right? what is the team behind this mission, how do we approach Indian language technology, and what have we contributed so far, and what does the roadmap look like going ahead, right? So let me uh, start with the mission. Our mission, very simply stated, is to make sure that the AI technology available for Indian lang languages is at the same quality as for English. Easy to state, but an extremely ambitious mission. If you understand the number of languages that we have in India, the number of tasks that we have, and the number of domains for which we need to make these technologies successful. And the way we are going to go about is the open source route. We are going to advance AI technology by making open source contributions in data sets, tools, models, and applications. So now, coming to our team, we have been very fortunate to have an extremely diverse team coming from very different backgrounds. We have Vivek, who is the chief AI evangelist at Extep Foundation and the chief mentor for us. Of course, the center is uh, co-led by Pratyush, Anoop, and myself. And we have been very fortunate to have excellent students, and that's where the IIT Madras ecosystem really helps us, who have come in and contributed to our efforts and excelled in various ways, right? And we continue to get getting these very energetic students who drive our mission. And now we are also proud to have a very diverse team of language experts coming from all across the country, literally from Kashmir to Tamil Nadu, Gujarat to Assam. And in fact, we have a poster outside celebrating this diversity. So during the poster session, I would like all of you to visit that and see how diverse our team is. While we have this in-house team, we also have had a lot of good collaborations, a lot of good partners from academia, startups, industry, both in India and abroad, who have gone along with us in this journey and helped us in various ways. Right? So now let me talk a bit about our approach to Indian language technology. Right? So most of you here come from a technical background, and you would know that we are in this deep learning era of uh, AI. And what that means is that there are these two components which are very important. There's data and there are models. Right? And what does a model mean? Right? So today, if I want to build an AI model, let's take as an example a model to translate from Hindi to English. Then what I need to build this model is tons of data. And when I say tons of data, I really mean it. We are talking about order millions, if not billions. Right? So today, if I want to build accurate systems for Indian languages, I need to curate the largest possible data sets for Indian languages. Professor Kama already mentioned this, and I would like to reiterate it. Right? And this data does not come for free. It does not come by sitting in a room. It has to be curated from various sources. Right? So we have to really look at data coming from the web. There are so many articles written in multiple languages on the web. Can we go and curate them? There are data sets sitting in uh, silos where the owners of the data sets don't really know the value of them. Can we unlock those data sets? Can we get into partnerships with foundations, government organizations, and get this data in, which will help in advancing this technology? And once we have this data, our goal is to build state-of-the-art, meaning the most accurate models for Indian languages in open source. Right? So we want to compete with the best. And this picture in itself is not complete unless I bring in the third element, which is applications, right? So our models and data sets will only be as good as the applications that we build that they will get used in. And that's the only way to get adoption at scale. And adoption at scale is an important theme for us at AI for Bar. So these three boxes that you see, which is data, model, and applications, these kind of form the core of our philosophy or the way we think about language technology. And you'll see these boxes repeating throughout the presentation. Right? And while we are talking about this philosophy, this philosophy is in the service of language technology. right? So what are the tasks that we are interested in? What are our areas of focus? So quite a few, and I'll name uh, some of them here. So transliteration, which is you take uh, a type of word in Roman, Roman script, and it automatically gets converted to a native script. Right? 
Then you have translation, which I'm sure all of you understand, and you also understand the importance of it in government, in education, and various other sectors. Right? Then we have language understanding. So a lot of us now use social media and like to post in our regional languages. So if you have a social media post, can I detect what's the intent of that post? Can I detect what's the sentiment of that post? These are the things which go under language understanding. The language generation. We all are used to auto-completion in, uh, in English. Right? You start and now uh, have some feature where you start typing a, a sentence and it automatically completes it. Where are these tools for Indian language? Right? So we need to build these for all the Indian languages. Right? And then speech recognition. If I speak to my phone, give a certain command, it should be able to recognize it in my native language and do the appropriate action. And Pratyush will later uh, talk a bit more about this. And in each of these tasks, as I said, we have been in this, on this journey for the past two years. We have made a lot of contributions. I'll just take a few minutes to highlight some of the important contributions that we have made. Right? So our first contribution, this is where our journey started, was to collect the largest monolingual corpora for Indian languages. Right? So for uh, 15 plus languages, we had collected 9 billion tokens from the web. As I said, data curation from the web is an important part of the deep learning story or of the deep learning success story. Right? And using this, we build a model which we call Indic Bird. We use the Indic Star as uh, branding for all our models. And this model gives a state of the art performance for 12 Indian languages for various language understanding tasks. It's publicly available and it continues to receive 10,000 plus downloads every month. Right? So, this slide, I want you to focus on a few things. One, is the scale. Focus on the numbers. They're in billions and billions. The second is the diversity, the number of languages that we try to uh, uh, tackle. And the third is the adoption. Right? We are keen that our models are publicly available, get downloaded, and be used by people. Right? Similarly, if you look at translation, so we are the first to curate this largest parallel corpora for 11 Indian languages, which has a total of 37 million pairs, right? which is a 4x improvement of what existed at that point. And this was useful. Because using this data, we were able to create the most accurate open source transla translation models. Of course, this is a statement uh, at the point in time. The models keep getting uh, uh, proposed and improved and so on. But we'll, uh, were open so we were the most accurate open source translation model. Right? And our models are being currently used in the Supreme Court. Again, adoption is a very important criteria for us. And they're being used to translate judgments and orders in nine plus languages in the Supreme Court. Next, I would like to talk about our work on speech recognition, where we again curated 17,000 hours of raw audio data for 40 plus languages. And this data was again used to train accurate speech recognition systems for nine Indian languages. And we continue to grow this effort, and we are expanding to many more languages as we speak. Then transliteration again, a simple problem of making sure that we all can enter input in our native languages was not really solved for all the Indian languages, right? And we are, our goal is to get to 22 languages. This is one task where we are very close to it. We are at 20 now. For 20 Indian languages, we have built these Romanized uh, converters, right? We take Roman text and convert to native languages. And they're, again, the best open source transliteration models on multiple uh, publicly available benchmarks. Lastly, for Indic NLG, we again have a wide variety of tasks there covering many languages. And this is the first major language generation model for Indian languages, which is called as Indic Bard, right? So while I've gone through all these contributions, right? So it's, it's a question which remains to ask is like, what next, right? What all do we want to do next? So again, I'll just show you the same three elements that we have, right? Data, models, applications. Along each of these axes, we need to double down and realize there's an endless list of problems to solve. And let me give you examples to explain what I mean by that. So if I look at data, if I want to build accurate speech recognition systems which are diverse and inclusive and representative of our very diverse population, then I need to go and collect speech data from every district in India. And there are 700 plus districts in India. This is a mammoth task for anyone to undertake. But it has to be undertaken, it has to be done only then our languages will have AI technology which is comparable with English. Similarly, when I talk about models, we have to build the most accurate models for Indian languages for all the 22 languages. It's not enough to say that we'll have a model for Hindi, Tamil, Bengali, the few languages. We need to have translation models for Bodo, for Santali. We need to have speech recognition models for Manipuri, 
for Konkani, for Kashmiri, and so on. Unless we do that, we'll not get this adoption at scale. So this has to be done. Similarly, in applications, we all know if you take off-the-shelf models and apply them to specific domains, the results are not often as desired, right? Because if you take the example of digital payments, you might have very different vocabulary there. I'm talking about transactions, payment, numbers, a lot of numbers and weird numbers, right? 136 and so on. So our models to work for specific use cases, they need to be fine-tuned for that domain which means, again, you might have to do small amounts of data collection in that domain. And this fine-tuning has to be supported. Again, in the Indian context, another important uh, feature is that when you talk about deep learning, we talk about big models and big scale. Fine, these can run on the cloud. But what is important in the Indian context is that these models should also run on mobile devices. Otherwise, again, they'll not get adoption at scale. Right? So these problems need to be solved. So put together across these three boxes, there are tons of problems to be solved. Right? And all of us have to come together and attack these problems. Only if academia, industry, startups, uh, foundations, and so on, everyone comes together and solves these problems, we'll be able to achieve our mission. And it's my wish and my dream that in India, we lead this open source language AI movement and all of us come together to solve the Indian language technology problem. And if you do that, I'm sure that our languages will not only survive, but even thrive in this ever-expanding digital world that we live in. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mitesh. I hope my introduction was true. And you did feel like you were back in the classroom, right? But thank you for providing uh, the cl clarity about what AI for Bharat is, what its mission is, the accomplishments which we have done, but how it is small in, in comparison to what we need to do. Right? Um, now I have the strange role of uh, inviting myself um, to, to talk about the next part. I am a researcher at Microsoft Research and also an adjunct faculty at IIT Madras. Um, what I would do uh, is take a few more minutes. I'll talk, uh, I'll talk a bit uh, in further to what Mitesh said, but also show you some demos and examples so it feels real. Right? But again, I'll go back to what Mitesh said about data models and applications. He spoke quite a bit about the work we have done in collecting huge data sets and training state-of-the-art models. And he also pointed out how applications is a next important milestone for us. I would like to situate that and tell you why this is the case. Right? Uh, we do know that uh, in the deep learning era of artificial intelligence, we need tons of data to train these large models. And they are being done in companies and organizations which have a funnel to collect more data and thereby keep improving these models. So the natural question is, for Mitesh's dream of open source language AI in India, how do we keep that sustainable? We have the Bhashini project, Professor Kamakoti mentioned that, which is collecting a large amount of data in India currently, right? and we are part of that effort as well. But how do we sustain that year on year? How do we keep getting data to improve these models? And this is where we believe that this third block of applications is important. We need to build reference open source applications at the cutting edge and deploy them at scale, hopefully at population scale, to be able to improve data sets and models. In particular, we would like to be able to ask the question, what kinds of models are actually useful in practice? Is the voice recognition model that I have built actually suitable for payments by voice or not? And we also understand, what does accuracy mean in the real world? If I say a name of an Indian friend, would that be recognized by my model? Now, this kind of information or feedback would not come until these apps have been deployed. But more importantly, we need to create a thick channel of data to come back to improve these models. Right? Uh, imagine us uh, being able to run voice recognition while kids are studying across the country uh, in, in, let's say, in primary schools. The amount of data that we would collect would go to further improve models specifically for children. Right? So this is, uh, this is the key thing that we realized, also in partnership with our mentors at Akestep Foundation. So what I would do now is to tell you what important applications we are thinking of building and are worth building to create this a positive cycle. Before that, it's maybe useful to recognize that apps are of different kinds. There are some applications that we need to create even data sets. For example, this first logo is of the Bhasha Dan platform from the Bhashini program. This encourages citizens to contribute data in their own language. You're doing a donation of data. 
And this is very important because you can have an app like this and the government can request students in colleges, schools to collect data. Right? This is one kind of app that is required. Another app is the Karya app. We have Sriram Rajmani here from MSR. He has been a big champion of this open source tool called Karya, which is running on mobile phones and can collect data from, let's say, rural communities where internet connectivity might be a challenge. We also do need to create tools for language experts working in organizations like AI for Bharat to collect data. So we have been building a tool called Shunya, uh, which is essentially, you can think of it as the operating system for AI for Bharat. How do people, the 100 or so people we have across the country, come together, collect data, manage things, and also ensure that the AI tools that we are building can be used to improve their efficiency. So that is one class of tools, right? Bhashadan, Karya, and Shunya. The other kinds of tools are on the model side. Once the model has been created, what kinds of applications can consume them? Now, there are a few classes there as well. The first class is language work. We have a large number of translators in the country. We have a large number of video transcribers in the country. They need to get the effect of these models getting better. We need to have tools where these cutting edge models are available and increase the productivity uh, of uh, language workers. So I'll be talking a bit about Chitralekha, which is for uh, transcribing videos. We also have Anuvad. Mitesh mentioned about our translation models being deployed in Supreme Court. They're happening within an application called Anuvad, developed by Vivek and others at Xstep. The second class of models, already discussed also, is to ensure we have let's say, software development kits for these models to actually run on phone and not on the cloud. Running on phone has various advantages, privacy being one. Right? You probably sometimes are not interested in sharing data, and you might want to run it on the phone. You may also have issues with connectivity, let's say, in rural India, where the mobile connectivity may still not be good enough. I'll talk about uh, that work as well. And the final class of applications involves more complex systems. We have to be ambitious and ask questions like, we have a Grammarly tool for English that can help you assist you while you're typing, let's say, a book. Why not a Grammarly for Tamil? Uh, we, why not uh, language tools that can help our children learn our languages much better? What about uh, misinformation? We have uh, with us uh, people from Ku. A lot of people are now tweeting in Indian languages. How can we build systems of systems that can ensure that information is actually reliable? And finally, we have a lot of multimedia content being created around the country. How do we ensure that these creators have the best AI tools? So this is a lot of stuff that, uh, that one could do. We are focusing on f a few of them. The first one is Shuni, as I mentioned, the operating system for AI for Bharat. Second one is Chitralekha. And the third is uh, on-device models. So I'm going to play a few videos that explain what we have been doing on this. Firstly, Shunya. Shunya is designed to make it easier to create language data sets at scale. It supports all the 22 scheduled languages of India. For ease of input, language contributors get the support of transliteration models which have been developed at AI for Bharat for all the 22 languages. A key feature is to enable language contributors to benefit from AI models such as machine translation to scale dataset creation. Support for auto translation works really well. The AI model gets most of it correct, but for small errors like it transliterates certain parts instead of translating it. For example, in this particular sentence, it transliterates the part Governor General and Council instead of translating it into Tamil as Alunar Matrum Avaradi Sabai. Urdu right se left ki taraf leke jaati hai aur shunya ka ye feature maujood hai. It's not that significant a thing but for us to be able to use this tool is really important. We have also come up with different ways to help our language contributors in low resource languages. Ingrezi par santali ka sura suri tojavat aliya gati lagi acha tha. Thoda ta aliya nokka mitta urkan lagi le refer lena jaate aliya bangla te input padhan le jaata riya. Nitu Jotu Yetirana, Edatalagi, Sulu, Ajal, the beat called Bangla Enema, Turjuma Utuida, or Aleota Santali Persitile Turjuma. Not a Sergi Gora Emma. Shunya enables multiple contributors to work together effectively. In our Manipuri team, we manage the translation workflow by checking the reports on weekly progress. Even though the entire team is remote, we have some cool features in Shunya. For instance, if there is some confusion in translating the task, we can add a note and set it to draft. We discuss it together and then complete the task. 
Shunya is built to meet the complex requirements of RML engineers. For instance, we can create tasks for sentence verification and then follow up for translations with all the verified tasks that are left. In AI, we have various different kinds of language tasks. On Shunya, it's possible to create UIs for different tasks by just uh, changing a few configurations file in the backend instead of having to implement the frontend for various different types of tasks. So this is actually something very cool and uh, easily extensible for various different uh, language tasks that we want to support. We have more than 100 language experts working from different parts of the country. It has been a great experience getting them all together on this tool. In just three months, the team has translated more than 1,20,000 sentences and we're looking forward to making it a million by the end of this year. We look forward to you using Shunya, which is available in the open source and hearing your feedback. Thank you. Thank you to the team for putting that together. So the Shunya tool, uh, we are very happy to announce, is being publicly released today in open source. It's available on GitHub. Yes. We have, in fact, many of our language members who are visiting us as well. Uh, but this tool is available to others to use, right? We, as we said, our spirit is to put it in open source and try to get as much feedback about how to use them. So we are very happy to be making that announcement today. Uh, the next tool that I would like to briefly talk about is Chitralekha. Let's again hear from the team. Chitralekha is designed to simplify translation and transcription. It supports automatic speech recognition in nine Indian languages. One can simply point to a YouTube video and run our speech model to create automatic transcripts. The user interface has been designed specifically to enable easy transcription by showing audio waveforms and boxes with the transcription. We support translating the input sentences into 11 Indian languages with our Indic Trans model. The errors made by these models can be corrected by manual edits and that too with transliteration support for easy input. The Chitralekha app is very helpful for us. We currently have a manual process where data is entered in different Excel sheets and documents. This app makes the workflow much better. We are interacting with the AI4 Bharat team to help support these. Thank you. Once the transcripts and translations are done, they can be exported into standard formats and uploaded in YouTube videos. NPTEL is the leading education portal in the country for higher education and has the maximum amount of content in technical subjects. Uh, recently, the government has a big mandate for us uh, to translate all this content, particularly technical content, into a lot of regional languages. We are really excited to hear about AI for Bharat's Chitraleka application, which is able to combine cutting-edge AI technology along with a very hands-on usable application so that people like us who run education portals can do translation effectively to translate content into multiple languages. Thank you. Thank you again to the team for putting that together. As you heard from Professor Andrew there, we are partnering with NPTEL, which is also housed here at IIT Madras, transcribe and translate the content uh, of higher education courses. Uh, and the government has a very strong mandate to do that. We are very happy to be able to participate with our open source tool. Again, we are announcing a public release of Chitralekha today. It will be available on GitHub for any other team to start using. Now I have the difficult job of doing a demo live. Um, and as you know, demos don't go well, but let's still try. One of the things that we have been doing is uh, build these models um, and put them on the government's Ulka platform, which has been designed as part of Bhashini. And often these models are pretty large and they need to run on the cloud. But a fair question to ask in the Indian context is how do we get these models to run on devices? So what I'm going to show here is this is a mid-range Android phone. I'm going to put it in airplane mode, meaning that it's actually running completely on the phone. And I'm going to try doing a few things. I'm going to try speaking in Hindi and try to get it to transcribe accurately. Uh, and I'm also then going to try and translate it to English. Uh, we do support many Indian languages, but this particular uh, pr uh, problem of moving them to the phones, we had tried to tackle first with Hindi to English, which is a dominant use case. So let's see how this goes. Aaj hum artificial intelligence ko kaise bharatiya bhashaon ke liye use kar sakte hain, iske sandarb mein charcha karenge. So let me just read out the Hindi part. Aaj hum artificial intelligence ko kaise bharatiya bhashaon ke liye use kar sakte hain, iske sandarb mein charcha karenge. That got, I think, right. 
Thank you. It also translated it in English to today we will discuss how we can use artificial intelligence for Indian languages. Please notice a few things here. Uh, it did uh, manage to get the word use, which is of course not a Hindi word, but this is how we typically speak with code mixing. And it did recognize and kept that context when it went to English. Also, artificial intelligence was recognized as an important word. It has been capitalized in the English uh, translation. So the model seems to retain this context. And you saw that it ran fairly fast. So it, it is really a real-time application on a mid-range phone. Right? Let me try one more example. Uh, try sending some money to Nandan. Okay, let's see if that works. Right? <laughs> Nandan ko 50 rupay bhej dijiye. <laughs> so uh, it does it does get uh, names Indian names and it's also able to uh, transcribe it. I would also like to bring one more use case of e-commerce. Uh, many people would like to get the tier two, tier three citizens into platforms like e-commerce. So let's see if I said I wanted to I had a grocery list and wanted to order a few items. Mujhe do kilo pyaaj, aadha liter dood, or amul butter chahiye. I want two kilograms of onion, half a liter milk, and amul butter. It did manage to also get the entity. So just to let you know, this is running completely on the phone, uh, and as I said, a mid-range Android phone, and fairly, uh, fairly real time. So we are quite confident that the large models that we are building, coming from the huge amounts of data, uh, large data sets we are collecting, can actually be moved to the phone and run efficiently uh, for various applications. Right? Uh, so with that, I would uh, end this particular section um, and invite Dr. Anoop on stage. Dr. Anoop is a researcher at Microsoft, and we would, he would like to speak about how we are collaborating with various teams around the world to push on the research front. We have so far talked quite a bit about data sets, and now I've talked about uh, models and applications, but this is all happening at the cutting edge, so Anoop will tell us about that collaboration. Thanks, Fritish. So far, you've heard about the data sets, the models, and the tasks we have been uh, working on, and uh, uh, and you might have uh, realized the complexity of the number of uh, languages uh, and the domains to be uh, worked on. Now, what this sort of uh, uh, indicates is that there are a lot of open uh, research problems which need to be tackled before uh, you can sort of have highly effective uh, solutions that can be adopted at scale. And what we want to do is make a, a huge impact in attacking some of these problems so that uh, we can address uh, and make a impact. Uh, so some of the issues that uh, come out and are and that we're interested in tackling are uh, things like, okay, so you might have seen that we are working with, the, let's say, 22 languages. And uh, one of the main challenges is the lack of training data. We are creating training data across different tasks, but there will always be a sort of paucity and there will be an imbalance. Uh, some languages might be better uh, resourced than others. So how do you kind of use data from some languages in order to improve the models for some other languages? Uh, particularly in the Indian context, where we have 22 languages which have a historical connection, which uh, share similarities. So how can we better use this similarity to sort of uh, improve models by uh, transferring knowledge from the better resource languages? Uh, second uh, area is, so a lot of these AI models today are trained to understand language in some sense by using uh, very simple uh, ideas of sort of predicting missing words and things like that. But can we do better? Can we infuse other ideas of, say, uh, incorporating uh, knowledge in some sense, etc., into these models. Uh, finally, uh, as Pratyush uh, talked about, uh, what is very important is how do we make these models uh, efficient uh, uh, in order to uh, deploy uh, and serve end users, but not just deploy, uh, to really truly democratize AI. We would want uh, to be able for researchers to train these models uh, with uh, modest hardware, etc. So how do you train, how do you adapt models to certain tasks with modest hardware is one of the areas that we are interested in. So what we want to do is sort of push the science in all these areas. And to do this, we really want to engage with researchers uh, across uh, different institutions. So we are working with a lot of many passionate uh, researchers coming from institutions like uh, Microsoft, of course, and then from uh, IBM Research India, from NICT Japan, from the University of Edinburgh, from the University of Copenhagen. So you can see that there is a wide representation of institutions across the uh, globe. And uh, with them, we are working on these uh, cutting edge uh, uh, technologies and uh, contributing uh, not just to Indian languages, but contribute back to the larger uh, ecosystem of NLP 
technologies and make, maybe making an impact not just for Indian languages, but other languages that are uh, low resourced as well. Uh, the other goal that we have is to kind of reach out uh, and generate a larger interest for Indian languages in the global academic community. Uh, so uh, what, why is this important? So we want the best minds in the world to look at problems uh, that we are uh, seeing and let them also put their uh, minds to that. And uh, to do this, what is important is uh, that we sort of uh, put out the data sets that we have, create standard benchmarks that uh, that can be uh, shared with teams who can compete on standard uh, data sets and push the boundaries of technologies. Uh, to this end, uh, we, we want to kind of reach out to different uh, global uh, researchers and audiences uh, by conducting workshops at uh, top tier conferences uh, in order to uh, get them on board and uh, help them uh, kind of know more about the scope and the kind of challenges that Indian languages have. Uh, we are already organizing a shared task at the workshop on Asian translation this year, and we intend to sort of uh, look at more uh, tasks uh, at uh, top tier venues uh, so as to uh, continue to engage the uh, global community. Uh, so with this, uh, 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 the goal broadly is sort of to uh, uh, first, uh, as Mitesh talked about, uh, get people uh, on board on an open source movement to develop tools uh, and resources, but also to uh, get researchers to tackle the big problems uh, that we face uh, with Indian language uh, technology. So, uh, so as I said, we have a collaboration with uh, Microsoft as well. So uh, we have a message from uh, Anand, who is uh, here from Microsoft, uh, on the work we are doing together. So let me just play that little message. On behalf of Microsoft, I am honored to be part of AI for Bharat's launch at the Nilakini Center in IIT Madras today. We have a unique set of challenges and opportunities with India's diversity in language. As a technologist, we have two key questions in front of us. What can we build? And more importantly, what does India need us to build? India needs digital inclusion for all citizens, accessible learning, and democratization of marketplaces. The code for this is language technology with respect to data collection, model training, and benchmarking. Microsoft is thrilled to be part of AI for Bharat's mission to bring parity with respect to English and AI technologies for Indian languages for empowering over a billion people in India. Thank you, and Jay. Thank you, Anu. Thanks a lot, Anup, and we look forward to the workshops and international conferences about uh, Indian languages in the years to come. Now I would like to invite uh, Dr. Vivek Raghavan, uh, who is the mentor at AI for Bharat, to share his thoughts. Dr. Vivek has been a successful entrepreneur and has also played a significant role in building the scalable systems that power India's Aadhaar identity platform. We are eager to hear from you on how we can combine building of digital public goods with entrepreneurial energy in the language AI space, please. Thanks, Pratyush, uh, for the introduction, and really glad to be here at the launch of this of this center. I think this is uh, it's really an exciting day uh, for that. But I want to actually set a little bit of context of you know uh, to to place this center in the larger uh, uh, context of the language ecosystem, right? And I think language is something that basically there are people, there are many many different entities that actually work uh, that that uh, that work on language for example you know there are people people use uh, these uh, people use uh, things in their daily life which actually can help contribute data for language there of course uh, the government actually has many siloed data sets which actually can be actually very relevant to actually make to and to be able to unlock those data sets to actually make make sure that that we can of course, you know, we know that there are big tech companies which are working in both collecting data and building models, and they're putting significant effort in those kinds of things. And of course, there are people, once you have built these core language models, play, people like startups, etc., are actually trying to build applications which can actually make a difference. And I think that's, again, you know, and of course, the core, as far as core, um, 
you know, uh, and then in terms of fundamental research, academia plays an important role. And of course, the, one of the places, especially when we're talking about something about language and we're talking about accessibility, many of the people who actually deal with things in Indian languages, NGOs actually play a very significant role. So all of these players actually have, so, and so therefore, we're trying to look at a way by which we can get everybody to collaborate and actually maximize both the, the data and therefore, once you maximize the data, you'll also be able to build uh, kind of, uh, uh, build state-of-the-art models. And that's really the core thing here, that if everybody can work together, then you can actually make Indian languages move forward. And that's the, the collaboration. And I think the concept of collaborative you know, AI as to how people can work together is something which is very important. And to do that, we need data. And then data, of course, can come through explicit collection of data or existing data. And then there are, of course, data is actually generated by creating meaningful applications that people will use. And all of this is driven by cutting-edge science. And I think all of these things are coming together today, uh, today in India. And I think that that's why this is so exciting, that we have the opportunity of actually having a new way of building uh, cutting-edge AI models in Indian languages. And I think I want to just... Uh, you know, segue into the, the there is basically the, the Digital India Bhashini project from the government of India. And I think this is something which actually is designed to actually take advantage of this collaborative, uh, collaborative AI. And there are a number of pieces. In fact, there is, there is a core thing known as ULKA, which is actually the Universal Contribution, Language Contribution a API, which allows people to, to contribute more data sets and models in standardized ways. There are these crowdsourcing efforts such as Bhashadan, which will actually collect significant amount of data from people in the country. And of course, the work that some of the data that's being collected is actually robust benchmarks. Benchmarks are actually the key to measure progress in, uh, in an area. And therefore, where there are high quality, and this is probably, uh, this is probably uh, true in general in AI, wherever there are high quality benchmarks, the progress has been actually improved. So actually, if you want something to actually progress, you need to make sure that there are high quality benchmarks for it. And of course, the end goal is to actually create models that are open source and state of the art that can be used. And in the end, unless you build applications and people are using these models at population scale, only then we actually have the sustainable loop which of, of actually continuously improving the AI models through the data that comes. And AI for Bharat is actually completely aligned to this, to the goals of the Digital India Bhashini project. And in fact, they have, they are probably today, they're actually probably the largest contributor of data as far as, uh, to, to Ulka, as far as machine translation, uh, speech, as well as transliteration. And, and that's, the, in addition to that, they have published over 100 models uh, in, uh, as part of the Ulka to action. And, one of the goals of them in the next year is to actually create robust benchmarks, diverse benchmarks in all 22 Indian languages as a result of that. And uh, as Pratyush had demonstrated earlier, we are the, the, we are the, the center is actually building some of these applications which are both responsible for data collection tasks, therefore to be able to get more and more people scale data collection in, the, in, in terms of experts, as well as build tools such as Chitraleka and Anubad, which are actually ways where people can actually use these models to actually achieve uh, translation tasks. So therefore all of these things are actually very aligned with the Digital India Bhashini project. Here I'm changing um, tack a little bit and say that one of the key things is actually, for AI for Bharat, is actually how they will engage with ecosystems. And so therefore, we are actually going to have a panel discussion. It's going to be today at, at 2 p.m., where we're actually going to bring a, a diverse set of people to discuss how the ecosystem in Indian language AI can actually be brought together and, and, and do things. And there are basically going to be people, uh, there are going to be startups, uh, for example, uh, Desi Crew, who actually uh, brings AI-assisted work to Tier 2 and Tier 3 towns. Uh, we're going to have a representative from KU, which is, of course, helping Indians communicate in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the social media space uh, in Indian languages and how the challenge is related to that. We have some people who actually come up with some innovative technologies to create uh, custom voice data sets for different domains, such as e-commerce, etc. 
We are also, we'll have uh, participants from the uh, National Payments Corporation of India, which talked about enabling, uh, you know, voice-based inter interfaces for digital payments. So actually, it's quite a diverse, and of course, we have uh, 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 representatives from Planet Read, where actually we are talking about a large-scale, same language subtitling to actually, to actually become a means to actually for fundamental uh, literacy as a means for fundamental research. And of course, uh, it, it, uh, we'll have Professor Pushpak, who is probably uh, one of the, is, 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 prob is, the is, is the advisor to at least uh, two of the three members of AI for Bharat, and, and actually the, the, the person who has, uh, who's actually the, 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 uh, the I would say the, the grandfather or the godfather of, of, <laughs> of, of, AI, in the, uh, of uh, AI in the country. And also we have uh, Sriram Rajmani, who's, who heads, heads up Microsoft Research, and, and I, I think, uh, you know, it's, again, that's, I think the, that collaboration with all these different ways is actually, is, is going to be something that is, uh, that uh, we hope to have a very interesting panel discussion later in the day. Uh, I will end with a couple of uh, videos from some of our, um, uh, from some of our ecosystem partners. So we'll start with Harsh from, from KU. Machine learning at KU. KU is India's first true social media platform connecting people with similar interest in their mother tongue. More than 40 million people have downloaded KU and have expressed themselves in their regional languages. These people come from more than 100 plus countries. One important technology solution that we are looking for is the enablement of romanized input with gesture typing for Indian languages. For example, if I swipe the characters G, H, A, R, then I would want the word Khar to be rendered in the Devanagari script. Among other things, building such technology requires data sets and models for transliteration. We are happy that AI for Bharat team has made significant contribution in this space by releasing the Aksharantar corpus and transliteration models supporting 20 Indian languages. Building on this work, we will collaborate closely with the Nilakani Center at AI for Bharat to enable gesture typing features for Indian languages and mobile applications. Of course, there is much more to do for Indian languages and we hope to work with the center to build a complete stack on content creation for Indian languages, which includes input tools, you know, spell checkers, offensive content filters, auto-completion models, and so on. We're excited about the partnership, and we hope that together we can make significant strides in Indian language technology. Thank you. Second uh, thing from, uh, from uh, the Billion Readers Initiative, which is actually a very uh, interesting initiative, and I'll let, let Bridge talk about it. Namaste. Wanna come? Game show. Namaskar. Well, you just experienced our innovation we call same language subtitling. So what you hear is what you read on the screen. Now in India, 600 million people are actually called literate, but they cannot read comfortably. They are actually weak readers. So same language subtitling is a solution to give weak readers in India regular reading practice on a daily basis and throughout their lives. In India, about a billion people watch television for three to four hours every day. So if same language subtitling appeared on all the entertainment content that people watch, they would automatically get reading practice. And this is proven in our evidence as well, eye tracking research as well as impact studies that people read automatically. Now this is the first such experiment of its kind anywhere in the world uh, to give reading practice to mainstream entertainment. Now, how do we scale this up, right? It has now actually become national policy that half the entertainment content across all television channels are required to have same language subtitling. So we are entering the implementation phase and we call it our Billion Readers Project at the Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad. And I am Ahmedabad is actually very proud to partner with the Nilakani Center at AI for Bharat uh, at IIT Madras. Um, and together, I think we can get reading out to 600 million people. I have a question for you. Throughout this video, were you reading along with the subtitles? If the answer is yes, then 600 million people who are weak readers will also get similar reading practice. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Vivek, uh, for those insightful comments, especially on situating AI for Bharat's work in the broader ecosystem and the different partners with whom we can work with, and also the alignment with the government's ambitious Bhashini project, which is very critical to what we are doing here at AI for Bharat. Now, we will move on to the much-awaited keynote address by Sri Nandan Nilakani, who is, of course, very well known to all of us. He's the co-founder and current chairman of Infosys, but he's more popularly known for his trailblazing innovation in the building digital public goods, starting with being the founding chairman of Aadhaar and continuing with his deep association with UPI, Fastag, GST, DEPA, and ONDC. In combination, these digital public goods are being used by almost every citizen of our country today. To hear about the impact of these contributions and also how language AI fits in this broader picture, the students and faculty of IIT Madras and members of AI for Bharat would like to invite Sri Nandan Nilakani to address us, please. Thank you, Pratyush, and it's really fantastic to be here at uh, IIT Madras for this wonderful uh, function. Uh, and uh, thank you, Professor Kamakoti, Anu, Pratyush, everybody, Mit uh, Mitesh, everybody, Vivek, of course, for, for having me here. I must tell you that, and of course, I want to apologize that Rohini was not able to make it. She was very keen to come but she fell sick at the last minute, so she dropped out and she sends her apologies and she, I assume she's watching on, 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 the, on the Zoom. I first came to IIT Madras 49 years back uh, because I came here for my IIT entrance, uh, you know, the, whatever, the, 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 I don't know, why, 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 they decide what, where you go. And uh, since I was in ba Bangalore, uh, Dharwad, I came here for my interview for the IIT entrance in 1973, so exactly 49 years back. And as I was coming here, I got a telegram from my father saying, join IIT Madras. And at 17 or 18, you're quite rebellious. So I said, I'm going to oppose my father, and I joined IIT Bombay. <laughs> so, but for that act of rebellion, I would perhaps have been a graduate of IIT Madras. So it's, it's great to be here. and. Uh, it's uh, this, what, what's happening here at the AF of Bharat is very, very exciting. For the last 13 years, a bunch of us, many of them are in the room, like Vivek and uh, JB and people, you know, the, we, uh, uh, Ram Sevak Sharma, who was my, you know, sort of my co-conspirator at Aadhaar and who's now running NHA, is building the health stack, and Ajay Bhushan Pandey, who was the revenue secretary. They were all, a, you know, all a bunch of people who were technocrats, IAS officers, politicians, who all came together to build many of the things that today are, are being used widely. And the first thing, of course, when I joined the government in 09, and uh, we had a sort of this bunch of people who put together and made Aadhaar happen, and that today we know is at 1.3 billion people, 50 million authentications a day, 5 million KYCs a day, so it's become ubiquitous. And then I was very fortunate after the, my stint at government to be the advisor to NPCI, and I think we have NPCI, Vishal is here. So uh, NPCI, and we, we worked on building the UPI platform, and NPCI did a great job in building what's probably the most advanced payment system in the world today, which last, last, year, last month did six billion transactions, last year did one trillion dollars of transactions. And what's really heartening is to see the ubiquitous nature of its usage, because when I walk around, I see vegetable sellers, coconut sellers, grocery guys, all taking payments in UPI. In fact, they don't want cash, they want UPI payments. So I think that's been a huge... Uh, yeah. And then, you know, in the last several years, we also built many other digital platforms. Today, uh, across the country is Fastag, which came out of a report which I did in 2010 which essentially allows trucks to go through, trucks and cars to go through toll stations, uh, you know, without stopping. And that does 100 crores of revenue per day. So it's about 40,000 crores a year. And because it is able to generate that kind of revenue, road investment have become more viable, which means they can be monetized, they can be sold. So the whole, you know, so technology can actually make a dramatic impact on many things. And there's several other things happening today which are equally exciting. Uh, one is, of course, ONDC the Open Network for Digital Commerce, which is, uh, which is going to essentially disaggregate e-commerce and make it very, very inclusive. And uh, again, big support from Digital India, from the government, 
And today, the company has been set up for ONDC, and I'm hoping that in the next two to three years, it will make an impact. Or what's happening with the account aggregator ecosystem, which is for the first time in the world, data will be, uh, people and companies and individuals will have access to their own data, which they can then use to get credit or they can make the health records portable or whatever. And they're just getting rolled out under the sponsorship of the RBI. And I think in the next three to four years, that will have a dramatic impact on democratization of credit in India. So there are many, many, many things happening. But a lot of the early work that was done in India on, on these digital platforms was transaction-oriented, how to digitize transactions, how to make things happen at population scale, very high volume, very low cost, you know, stuff like that. But over the last four or five years, I think, now with the data which is getting generated, it's the logical place to think of AI as a way to go. And that's been the recent trend in the last few years. And Vivek Raghavan, who's here, has really been a pioneer in applying AI to these uh, things. For example, I don't know whether you realize, but in the Aadhaar authentication is a very, very good case of AI, not only for accuracy, but also for liveness testing. We want to make sure that the person is in a, when there's a fingerprint or there's an, you know, um, sort of uh, iris scan or a face scan, how do you know it's a real person and not a photograph or a gummy, gummy print? And the, all the liveness testing in Aadhaar is actually in, built by Vivek. Or today, when you look at the tax systems, we have GST and all that, they all use AI for fraud detection. And I believe one of the reasons for robust tax collection today in India is that AI is being used to catch fraud. So I think we're already seeing great examples of AI uh, in country, in the public space at population scale. And then, of course, there was this effort to do AI in the Supreme Court that uh, Pratyush and Vivek and all refer to. And when doing that, Vivek mentioned to me that there's this amazing bunch of guys in IIT Madras. Now, you know, all my philanthropy so far has been IIT Bombay. So I said, I better do something in IIT Madras. So uh, then I, uh, and Vivek is a very hard guy to please, very hard guy to please. Like his standards are like way above anything else. So I, I asked Vivek, are they good? He said, they're very good. I said, are they better than you? He said, yes. <laughs> now for Vivek to admit that somebody is better than him means they must be very, very good. So that gave me the confidence to support this extraordinary effort here. And uh, I think the work here at the AIFR Bharat, I think, will be extraordinarily beneficial to India. I think if everybody in India on their devices can use all Indian languages, get access to content, talk to people, uh, you know, get access to e-commerce at population scale, get access to social media at population. And this is really something which is going to be transformational. And I think uh, I'm very, very excited by what's going to happen. I think uh, Mitesh and everybody else has a very ambitious task. The building some truly world-class technology. And also, I think this is an area where, you know, the question in the whole space of AI is how do you create a breachhead? How do we demonstrate in some part of AI that what we have is cutting edge and better than anybody else? And the logical place is Indian languages, because where else do you have the kind of diversity we have? We have 22 Indian languages in the official list that they're all covering, but there are many, many more Indian languages. And this variety is, is, is unbelievable. And therefore, this center and the extraordinary people here and the young students who are all participating have really a chance to set cutting edge uh, you know, standards on, on AI for the world. And while, of course, you know, big tech firms are applying AI, they will look at it on a global scale. There are many more languages to deal with. Uh, the fact that in, we'll do it here for Indian languages and really train these models, I think, is going to be exceptional. And that's why this center is so strategic for India to have a breachhead in, uh, you know, in the whole space of AI. And I'm very happy that we have many collaborators, principally uh, Microsoft. I'm very happy to see Anand and Sri Ram and all here, and the support that they have given uh, the work at AI for Bharat. It's also important to realize that what we are doing here, which is really part of a larger mission, which is the Bhashini mission, is in some sense a new paradigm for AI development. Uh, you know, the way 
you know, in AI, you have, of course, you have models, you have data, and you have people, and all that come together. But typically, they, they, they work in a, in a closed fashion in the sense, you know, they're inside large corporations, so large corporations can afford to spend billions of dollars on AI, and they also have the consumer use cases that generate the data for their AI. So they're like a self-contained in that sense. Or they can work in governments, you know, like other countries, huge amount of data comes from government systems, so every traffic light is capturing everybody passing by and all that. But I think what is happening in Bhashini, the National Language Translation Mission, is a very unique and differentiated approach to AI, which I think mention was made by the previous speakers, which is what we can call as collaborative AI. In other words, how do we create a model where everybody pitches in and contributes and makes the system better. And this is what is happening in the Bhashini mission. And AIFA Bharat and the Nilikan Center is going to be a key part of that game. And what does that mean? First of all, I think the fact that the models are available from elsewhere and are being constantly improved. And they're all getting back into open source. So there'll be all these open source models. But also the fact that the data for this will be sourced from everywhere, including from crowdsourcing. And we heard about different methods of getting crowdsourcing data in. So the idea of open data and open models is really quite a unique way. And nobody's done this at a population scale for an entire country. So really what we have is a paradigm on how AI can be done in India. And this paradigm can be applied to any other field. So tomorrow, for example, if you want to create a massive agriculture AI, we can use the same concepts of using open models and uh, you know, crowdsourcing data. And you could build a phenomenal data, you know, AI for, uh, for agriculture or whatever. It doesn't matter which field it is. So we have to think of AI for Bharat and the Bhashini approach, the ULCA, that universal language contribution API that we talked about as a template on how to do AI beyond language. So language will be the first of, of these things. The other important part of this, apart from the fact that it's collaborative and crowdsourcing and, and so on, is the built-in benchmarking which they have designed. And why that benchmarking is important is that the benchmarking creates a neutral, dispassionate, method of assessing whether a particular thing is solution is more accurate than others. Because in the AI world, there are lots of people with lots of models, lots of data, lots of claims. And how do you simplify and standardize this whole thing? And that's what the benchmarking is doing here. So I think the benchmarking that Vivek and all have designed is actually designed to continuously A, make sure that everybody's work is put to the same test, and B, as we get better models, as you get better data, you can replace one with the other without changing anything because they're all going through the same APIs. And therefore, we can always keep the stuff improving at the cutting edge. So on the one hand, the data will keep improving. On the other hand, the models will keep improving. So you've created a virtuous cycle of improvement uh, architecturally to drive uh, what I think will be a, a very big, you, you know, use a uh, big, uh, uh, you know, take, taking this to best in class in a systematic, virtuous cycle approach, which is built into the design. I hope I'm right when I say this, guys. Uh, built into the design. And then, so that, and you can, again, this can be applied to any field. This idea of very rapidly co collaborating, crowdsourcing, benchmarking, and just raising the game at a population scale. And then there's the whole issue of adoption. I think adoption is very, very important because, you know, Again, in the, typically in the corporate world, the companies that have the data can only adopt it, and therefore it creates. But here, this is open to everyone. And we believe that there will be users. There will be, obviously, there will be a large number of startups. Many of them are here, and they'll be on the panel discussion. There will be governments. In fact, I assume that many governments will be visiting here because every state government wants to implement in their state language. There will be NGOs. There'll be, you know, all uh, big companies. Uh, there'll be large players like NPCI who want to bring in all languages into, you know, all their consumer products. Imagine there are 
260 million people using UPI, and if they can all use Indian languages, then it just changes the game. So I think adoption is very important. So if we can get this virtuous cycle going, where we keep improving data, we keep improving the models, we keep improving the adoption, we use benchmarking to make sure that we're using the best-in-class uh, models, and if the partners we work with contribute their data also back, I think that's very important, and we would request all our big users like NPCI and Ku and others to contribute the data back. Then we got a sort of multiple virtual, cy uh, virtual, virtual cycles going, which will take this to a whole new paradigm of, of functioning, which I do hope that we'll get there. Also, I believe that this is something, you know, one of the big things happening in India is that India's approach to digital public goods, whether it's Aadhaar or UPI or AI for Bharat or whatever, has actually now become a unique template of how do we, how do societies up the game using technology? And really, there's no one else who's done this because this has been a multi-year journey and it's also been about improving, it's improving the productivity of a society. It's, you know, like for example, if it takes, uh, you know, it took one week to open a bank account earlier, if it takes two minutes to open a bank account, and if you open 100 million bank accounts, that means the 100 million opportunities for productivity improvement. Or if the truck going through the toll gate took three minutes earlier because they had to get the change for the money, and now they can drive through in 10 seconds, that means every time a, a truck goes through a toll gate, there's a productivity gain, and so on. So what we have is productivity in microtransactions multiplied by billions of transactions, right? So that actually means we have been on this productivity journey uh, in all the things that we are doing, including what we're doing in languages. And this is all very, very important. The fact that there's productivity built in, the fact that it is at population scale, the fact that it is inclusive, you know, the fact that it's at very low cost, microtransactions, small value, these are all very, very powerful strategic things. And therefore, the whole world is looking at that and in fact, as you know, the Indian government is now looking actively, they've just put out indiastack.gov.global, where they put out all these Indian digital public goods for the world to see. I do hope that uh, India is going to host the, the G20 next year, and I'm sure this is going to be one of the important topics. Similarly, philanthropists have come together, uh, Gates Foundation, Rockefeller, myself, and uh, Omidyar, and set up something called Co-Develop, to how to get more, there's tremendous interest around the world on how to do digital public goods and the CEO of Code Develop, Madhukar, is here. So I think there's a lot of stuff happening where we can take this digital public goods global and we're doing it with the right motives. It's not to make money, but to take this technology. And similarly, I do hope that AI for Bharat will ultimately become AI for the world. AI for Bharat, you know, so for example, I mean, every country has the same issues of multiple languages. And I'm sure that with the infrastructure that we created, we can very quickly apply it to other uh, languages around the world. So I think this is, again, let me end by saying that this is a very important and very strategic uh, initiative. Uh, I'm really delighted to be part of it and to contribute to it. I, I do believe that in the next two to three years, if we do everything right, it's going to have a dramatic impact on the lives of many, many billions of uh, billion people. And I'm convinced that IIT Madras and AIF Bharat is the right place to do this. So all the very best. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for your inspiring words. Uh, you have set up collaborative AI as a key clarion call, and we will follow up on that. Um, now we would like to take some questions. This is a unique opportunity to meet uh, uh, Nandan Nilakini directly. So we'll take a few questions in the hall, and perhaps there are one or two from the uh, online audience. So please raise your hand, and I'll walk to you with the mic, and you can ask your question. Yes. Please also do introduce yourself, uh, name, and organization that you are coming from. Awesome uh, presentation, Nandan. Um, yeah, Bridge Kothari from I am Ahmedabad. Uh, you know, you, uh, what's that? Did you get your fifty rupees that Pratyush sent to you? I'm still waiting for the. I'm not getting. I'm not on an alert yet. So. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, so so more seriously, um, I think I think you have been actually at the forefront of launching the model that you just uh, spoke about. So so we are all grateful for that. Um, I'm. I have a question. When we think of use cases. 
there might be a tendency in all of us to kind of approach it more as a technologist. Uh, how do you, when you m meet your vegetable vendor, uh, how do you think we should be approaching in teams where we have actually use cases for AI coming from the ground up and how can we scale that up? Sure. No, I think obviously we have to uh, jumpstart the adoption through talking to, you know, you potentially including like you, your billion readers program and all that. But all my experience has shown that if we create extraordinarily useful technology, people will adopt it. You don't have to, you know, they, they, they see the value before you and I will, I'm not you, you may see it, but I may, I may not see it. You know, for example, when we launched Aadhaar in 2009, we, we first launched in Jharkhand or somewhere, and we had queues and queues of people wanting to enroll. And we were actually quite amazed at what, what, what's driving them, and we realized that these are people who don't have any piece of paper, they don't have an ID, they don't have a birth certificate. For them, this was the first thing, and it was a no-brainer for them to come and stand in the sun and, and, and enroll, right? Similarly, uh, recently I was talking to the CXO of a very large company, and during the pandemic, uh, he, he, he wanted to give some cash to his maid, and so it, he was going to give physical cash, and his maid said, why don't you use GPay, you know? So clearly, people have, when they see the power of something, they will just use it. So I think if we can do enough lighthouse cases of this technology, like billion readers, like cool, like slang labs, like NPCI does, believe me, it will just take on like wildfire. And I think, uh, and, the, and people will find users that we didn't dream of. I think that's the whole thing. That's the whole thing of innovation, right? And my whole approach is if you create the rails at population scale, you make it ultra cheap or free, you make it small transaction value, instant uh, real-time response, It'll just all kinds of phenomenal use cases will emerge that we can't even contemplate in this room. So I'm, I'm very confident that we get that right, it'll happen. Uh, thank you, Pitish. I'm Mani, sir. I'm uh, representing Desi Crew, one of the partners with uh, AA for Bharat. Uh, thank you for the uh, wonderful uh, speech. My question is on the other side. What Professor talks about the use case, we talked about the data and data quality as the fundamental foundation for all our work. And we've done some work in that area in terms of going to rural areas. My question is that how important or how difficult is that challenge? Because user contributing uh, to the system, like the Aadhaar case, where I need my Aadhaar for certain things, is very different from somebody doing a contribution on the source side or the raw material side. Is there any incentive or are the constraints in the larger system we can work on that? Well, I think, again, I think in, in the beginning we'll have to uh, figure out how to get the initial data. But I think. If, if we start getting these adoption use cases, uh, and I think Karya also, they're trying some, something there. Uh, but, but I think if you get the adoption use cases, you will get the data. I mean, like if NPCI uses voice commands or voice recognition in trade union languages on UPI, and that data comes back to this, we're done. If they're doing one billion, six billion transactions a month, and even if you say one billion is in Indian languages, there's one billion voiced commands that will come back, right? So you get that flywheel going, it'll be massive. I'm not worried about it once we get the flywheel going. Uh, this is Pushpak Bhattacharya. From I was, how I met at that <laughs> Supreme Court event. <laughs> the professor comfort. Yeah. So, uh, I, I was just referred to as the grandfather of NLP. Godfather, <laughs> godfather. <laughs> okay. So, and, uh, so uh, you are, of course, uh, very helpful to IIT Madras, but don't forget IIT Bombay, too. No, no, no. <laughs> okay. No, no. <laughs> I, I teach no, no. in the computer no. science department, IIT Bombay. Yeah. So, my, my question is maybe slightly out of your co comfort zone, maybe, in the sense that, uh, you know, when we deal with language. Uh, deal with? Lang language. Huh. Language. Language is not only data. Language uh, actually is expression of cognition, and there is a hu huge amount of sentiment, emotion expressed through sentiment, uh, through a language. So, once you have taken care of these basic needs of you know a, a truck going very, uh, very speedily across the 
gate, for example, and facilitating the day-to-day -day life of, uh, of, uh, of, of uh, people. Uh, do you see, you know, entering into this realm of sentiment, emotion, cognition, etc.? And would you have any comment on that? It's a vague question. Anyway. Yeah. No, I mean, there's one part of this which is just allowing a billion people to participate, right? That's a, that's a straightforward thing. I mean, if, if somebody can order the, uh, you know, the e-commerce stuff in Telugu and it translates to English and then this, he gets the eggs and the amul butter, that's a straightforward thing. That, that's, that's a transaction, right? Similarly in payments. But I think as you raise the level of what you want to translate, then I think, it, I, I think Manish is here. He runs New India Foundation and they've just launched a translation program for books. Now, obviously, you want to trans you know, you want to, if you have a book which is a award-winning book in Malayalam, it's not just using AI, right? So I think we have to think of, use, think of this AI in those cases as an amplification of human capability. It's not a replacement of human capability. So I would say that if there's somebody who's translating a book and they take, you know, four months to translate a book from Malayalam to English. If they use the tools from AI for Bharat for Bashini, and if they're able to translate 90% or 80% or whatever their accuracy is going to be, and then that translator then polishes that translation to get the sentiments and all right. So we have to see this as a joint, it's like a, a very qualified and very capable person using this. And if he can get it done in one month, then he can do four books a month instead of one book in four months. So I think we have, for, for more higher end translation, I think it, it cannot be done without human, uh, this thing. And we should, but we should do as much heavy lifting from the AI as possible. And for that final getting the book right, getting the author's sentiment right, getting the author's emotion right, I would still require a very talented translator. So I think I would see it as a collaboration of that type. Namaste, sir. Uh, I'm a big fan. My name is Harsh. I'm from Coop. Yeah, I saw your video. Yeah. Uh, I had a question that was a bit uh, tactical in for a lot of these researchers in AI who are not using open source but want to build their own contribution. So they don't get access to GPUs. A lot of that is very hard to get unless you work in a company that has big budgets for you know, GPUs and AWS and so on. Uh, what do you think can solve this uh, at the government level to get access to these good compute infrastructure? Well, actually, uh, well, I don't know exactly how you're doing it here, but I think as part of the Bashini program, there is a G I think there's a GPU cloud, right? There's a GPU cloud with uh, uh, CDAC, right? There's a CDAC GPU cloud, which I think will be used for Bashini. So I think we'll have to have these kind of GPU clouds, uh, either institutions or in the government to and of course, the trade-off, the, the, the bargain is if you use that GPU cloud, then you have to contribute everything back. So that could be, that's a good bargain. So that'll also help get more data into the thing as well as allow people to use the cloud. But I don't know the exact model that they're doing. Good. So there's one last question, sir, from online audience. They want to know what is your next big thing uh, that you're thinking of? <laughs> I mean, isn't this enough? I mean, how much more you want me to do? No, I mean, look, if we can, in the next three to f three years, if we can get AI in 20 Indian languages so that that guy sitting in some village somewhere is able to order anything he wants, if every individual and business can get a loan in real time on his phone, and if that retailer in the comp shopping complex can sell online, provide his own version of quick commerce to your house, that's good enough, yeah. Let's please thank the speaker once again. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. I would now like to invite Professor Mahesh, Dean Alumni and Corporate Relations, to please deliver the vote of thanks. Good morning. Um, it's an honor to be in the company of uh, the architect of modern digital India, Srinandan Nilekani. Uh, we've heard the long line of uh, digital public goods that he has help champion and build. And I must add one, little, one more little adjective, across administrations and parties in power. In a country like India, that speaks volumes as well of the individual. Thank you, sir, for your service to the country. Um, and it, 
I'm very, we are very grateful for that. Today we are here, we had the wonderful occasion of the launch of the Nilekani Center at AI for Bharat. I also want to join the Rector Professor Kamakoti and everyone else for expressing our gratitude for your contribution, but I see your association by name as being the biggest contribution that you've made. Thank you very much for naming this center uh, uh, with uh, giving it a stature by associating your name with it. You know, at IIT Madras, uh, pursuit of excellence in every way is the way of, is, has become a way of life. Over the last seven years, we've been ranked number one in the NIRF rankings. We've been ranked the best educational institution four years in a row. On several sets of objective parameters, we float up to being one of the best institutions. We don't take these lightly. We look at those achievements with a great sense of responsibility. To set the tone for what, to set the tone for where India needs to be going, technology-wise, policy-wise, and as a society. And several of our faculty members and students gravitate towards endeavors that are aligned to this responsibility. I think the AI for Bharat initiative is front and center in that respect. Today we are here to talk about languages. And when Mitesh first came to me, my dream, the, I mean, I'm, a, I'm not a computer scientist, my vision was a, a farmer in Karnataka is able to type their WhatsApp message in Kannada, and a farmer in Bengali is able to read the message in Bengali, type the response in Bengali, and the farmer in Karnataka is able to read the response back in Kannada. And seamlessly not knowing that they were from different states. And when, when Mitesh first came with this suggestion, with this proposal, uh, my uh, response to him was that this is going to become an absolutely essential tool for the unity of the country itself. Uh, no other digital public good that you've created as sir stands up to that level of scrut scrutiny. <coughs> I really look to send that WhatsApp message, uh, you know, whenever your technology is ready, please alert me. Even if it's in the middle of the night, I want to be part of that, that endeavor. Um, lastly, I want to uh, conclude my remarks by thanking everybody that has is, that is attended this event. I know it's a large contingent of students, faculty, and professional uh, team members of AIF of Bharat that, have, that are behind this wonderful initiative. And I want to remind all the students uh, also, you know, Nandan mentioned that he was here 49 years ago on IIT Madras campus. I want to remind all the students and everybody else listening, listen to your parents. <laughs> okay? Thank you. <laughs>